This is the second lecture of week one where we're going to focus on bacterial proliferation, metabolism, as well as quality control. We're going to start out by discussing microbial proliferation. Bacteria require certain things in order for them to grow appropriately. So bacteria will need specific environmental factors and chemical factors in order to grow. Environmental factors will include things like temperature, pH, osmotic pressure, and oxygen. The chemical factors include things like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, some trace elements, atmospheric oxygen, as well as some growth factors such as vitamins and amino acids. In order for bacteria to grow, some bacteria like specific temperatures. For example, psychrophiles like to grow between the temperatures 0 to 20 degrees Celsius with a maximum growth at around pro approximately 12 to 15 degrees. Psychro means cold and phile means loving. So these are the cold loving group of organisms. An example of a psychrophile would be Flavobacterium or an organism we're going to discuss later in the semester is Listeria monocytogenes. A mesophile is where most of the bacterial organisms fall into. They have a growth range of around 12 degrees up to about 45 degrees Celsius. However, they have a maximum temp growth temperature of, I mean, not Matt, their maximum rate of growth is going to be at a temperature of around 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. And that's organisms such as Escherichia coli and many, many of the other organisms we're going to discuss. The medically significant organisms tend to fall in that mesophile range because that is the range that body temperature falls into. The next group are the thermophiles, thermo meaning heat and phile loving, and these are the organisms that like to grow at temperatures between about 42 degrees and up to almost 70 degrees Celsius. We then have the extreme thermophiles that like very, very, very high temperatures. These are organisms that like to grow at around 68 degrees up to almost 100 degrees Celsius. So these thermophiles and extreme thermophiles are the organisms that are found in hot springs and in for, uh, water heaters and things like that. They like, they like much higher temperatures. Not only do bacteria require specific temperature or temperature ranges for growth, they require specific oxygen atmospheres. So the categories of bacteria regarding oxygen are the obligate aerobes, the microaerophiles, the obligate anaerobes, facultative organisms, or aerotolerant anaerobes. So for our obligate aerobes, those are bacteria that need oxygen. They have to be in an aerobic environment in order to grow. If they are in an environment with no oxygen at all, these organisms will not grow. The microaerophilic or microaerophile bacteria, they will grow in the presence of oxygen as long as there's not too much oxygen present. They will not grow at all if there's no oxygen. So oxygen is required, but at levels below 0.2 atmosphere. The obligate anaerobes will not grow at all in the presence of oxygen. They will only grow in an environment that has no oxygen at all. Oxygen is actually toxic to the obligate anaerobic bacteria. Our facultative organisms, that's where a lot of our medically significant bacteria fall into, will grow in the presence of 
oxygen and also will grow where there's less oxygen. So oxygen isn't absolutely required for growth, but oxygen is utilized when it is available. We then have our aerotolerant anaerobes where Again, we'll grow, would prefer to grow in an anaerobic environment, but won't get killed in an environment where there is some oxygen. So oxygen is not required for growth, and they don't utilize oxygen for growth. But oxygen in these organisms is not toxic as it is in the obligate anaerobes. Bacteria proliferate through binary fission where the DNA material is copied and then the organism just separates and divides and then one organism becomes two, two organisms become four, four become eight, and so on and so on. Bacteria grow in stages. So usually bacteria will start out in what's called the lag phase. The lag phase, there's a lag in the growth because the growth starts out a little bit slowly. This is when a bug enters a new environment and it needs to acclimate to that environment. So it won't start doubling at its normal rate. When it starts to double at its normal rate, it's in log phase. That's when it acclimates to that environment, its metabolic machinery is running smoothly, and they are in exponential growth. So they are doubling within their normal doubling time, where E. coli has a 20, around a 20 minute doubling time. Once organisms will are growing at an exponential rate, there usually comes a point where they're utilizing up all the nutrients in the media. So at that point, the, the organisms are going to start to slow down their growth rate. They then become static and enter into this stationary phase where the growth rate will stop for a period of time. They will start shutting down some of their metabolic machinery so that they're not utilizing too many nutrients. If there's no new nutrients put into the system, the bacteria will then enter a death phase where they can't stay in that environment, their nutrients are all used up, and toxic waste will start to build up. We're now going to talk about metabolism. So there are several um, pathways that bacteria will utilize to gain energy. And I'm sure you covered these in a general microbiology course. We are not going to go into detail in these pathways since we, we are more focused on the medically significant microbes and not these specific pathways that are covered in general micro. But as you might remember, the pathways are the emden meyerhoff parnas or EMP, hexose monophosphate fate shunt or the entner duerdorf duerdorf pathway bacteria are ordered to catabolize or have catabolism in a fermentative way or through respiration so bacteria that catabolize through fermentation will do so without any oxygen. So oxygen is not required in bacteria that will undergo fermentation. So bacteria will undergo fermentation and will generate things like lactic acid, mixed acids, propionic acid. Bacteria that catabolize via respiration do require oxygen to be present. So in aerobic um, respiration, oxygen is the final hydrogen acceptor. And in anaerobic respiration, oxygen salt is the final acceptor. So what's important here really is that there are two uh, main ways that bacteria will catabolize and that those are fermentation, respiration. Respiration requires oxygen, fermentation does not.
Utilization of carbohydrates by bacteria. You have fermentative utilization where a bacteria that is going to ferment will produce very high concentration of acids when they're in an anaerobic environment. For non-fermentative organisms, you don't get any acid production when you're in an anaerobic environment. The non-fermentative bacteria, you'll have two different types. You'll have the oxidizers and the non-sacrolytic or asacrolytic organisms. The oxidizers will produce small amounts of weak acids under aerobic conditions, but they will not produce any acids under anaerobic conditions. The asacrolytic or non-sacrolytic organisms don't produce acid at all. Whether they're in the presence of oxygen or no oxygen, they will not produce any acids. These types of um, features are important in order to differentiate one organism from another. So in a lot of our biochemical tests throughout microbiology, what we are doing is detecting the metabolic end products, which usually will give us some sort of reaction. In many of our tests, it's a color reaction. So a lot of the tests in microbiology have an acid indicator that will change a color when these types of acids are present. Some of our indicators are gas indicators because there are some organisms that will uh, generate gas byproducts and there are also growth indicators. A very, very important differentiation activity in uh, metabolic activity in bacteria is what's called MVIC. And MVIC stands for the tests indole, methyl red, Vogue's Proskauer, and citrate. So for our indole test, that's a test that is going to look for the action of tryptophanase enzyme on the tryptophan in the bacteria. So indole is a very, very common test. And later on in the semester, we are going to be talking about organisms that are either indole positive or indole negative. Another test is methyl red. This is going to test for strong acid production in organisms that use the mixed acid pathway. The Vogue's Proskauer test detects the production of acetylmethyl carbonyl, or what's called acetoin. And then citrate tests for the ability of organisms to utilize citrate as their sole carbon source. So, MVIC is four different tests that you can use to differentiate one organism from another organism. A very, very important method used in the clinical micro microbiology lab is to streak for isolation. So the, the concept of streaking for isolation is taking a sample and concentrating it in one quadrant or one area of your petri dish. You, what you want to do is you take a, a loop and you're either using an old-fashioned metal loop that you would flame to kill the organism off of it, or you might be using in a clinical microbiology a sterile loop that is disposable. So you would use your sample and streak one quadrant where you get very, very concentrated organism. You then use a fresh sterile loop or you would heat your loop to kill the organism off it, allow it to cool, and then streak a second quadrant by only going into that first quadrant a couple of times. That's going to spread the organism out and kind of dilute it out without making actual dilutions. Again, you take a fresh um, loop 
or you heat your loop, cool it, and you make a third quadrant and then a fourth quadrant. Each quadrant should generate less and less organisms. And in one of those later quadrants, usually the third quadrant or the fourth quadrant, you're going to start to get isolated organism or isolated colonies. And that's what you want in clinical microbiology because you want to see how many different types of organisms are, pre are present and you want to be able to see the um, possibly find the organism of interest and isolate that one on a pure culture and get it away from the other organisms that might be present. This slide shows the difference between good streaking and bad streaking. So on the left hand side you can see a nice, a very nice um, streaking method where on the top Towards the left, you have your first quadrant, and then it goes into the second quadrant where you still have a ton of bacteria and no isolation. By the third quadrant, you're starting to get some isolated colonies there. And the fourth quadrant, you have very nice isolation where you'd be able to see different characteristics in the macro, um, macroscopic or non-microscope use of morphology. On the right hand side, you have all different quadrants that are mixing together. So quadrant one is kind of mixed up with quadrant three and you don't have very good isolation on that plate. So your, your, your goal with streaking is to get really nice isolated colonies by the third or fourth quadrant. So that was macroscopic morphology where you're looking at an auger plate and you're looking at the different characteristics of the organisms growing on the plate. And another important aspect to not only just looking at the organism and seeing the difference between one or another is actually really looking at that morphology in detail. So what does that colony look like? Is it dry? Is it more moist looking? Does it have wavy edges? That might give you an indication of which type of bacteria you might be looking at. So some of the typical colony shapes of bacteria on an agar plate, you're going to see circular forms, very irregularly shaped organisms, filamentous organisms that look like they have little um, veins coming out of them. You have raised colonies, flat colonies, umbinate, which have a little bump in the center. Um, so all these different colony sh uh, shapes that you should familiar familiarize yourself with before you go into the clinical laboratory where you're going to see a lot of these different types of organisms. When you describe colony morphology, it's, it, it is important in a clinical lab to be able to describe what, it, what the organism looks like effectively. So you want to look at the colony shape and the, and the colony size. Is it regularly shaped or irregularly shaped? Is the size, is it a large colony or is it a pinpoint colony? You want to look at the margin or the edge. Is it smooth? Is it wavy or undulate? You want to look at the elevation off of the plate. Is it very flat? Is it raised off of the plate? Is there a little bump in the center, which would be the umbinate? You want to look at the color. Is it a white colony? Is it a gray colony? Is it a red colony? You want to look at the texture. Is it a dry texture? Is it a wet looking organism? Is it very mucoid, which as you recall would indicate that there might be a capsule present. So describing colony morphology is very important because you as a microbiologist working in a clinical lab will be able to look at a plate and say, oh, I'm quite sure we have a streptococcus here based on the fact that we have a pinpoint gray organism that grew on a specific type of media and is smooth and etc, etc. Which brings us into culture media. So we want to look at our macroscopic or with our eyes morphology on our media. And now it's important to know what media you, you want to use to grow different organisms.
So media in general for to grow bacteria, it has to have the appropriate nutrients in it. It must be have a sufficient moisture. So bacteria that are allowed, um, bacteria plates, sorry, media that are allowed to maybe sit around past their expiration date might start to dry up. Or if you have a, a little sleeve of plates that you've opened and removed a couple of plates and you don't seal that bag back up, those plates could start to dry out. The media should have the proper pH, and of course it should be sterile. Now that sounds kind of funny, but whenever you are doing some streaking for isolation with organisms or with patient specimens, before you start streaking that plate, the very first thing you always want to do is first look at the expiration date on those plates, make sure they're within the expiration date, look and make sure the color of them is, is correct. And when you open up the lid of the Petri dish, dish before you streak, you want to make sure it's sterile. Because every now and again, plates get contaminated and you wouldn't want to streak your patient sample on a contaminated plate because then you wouldn't know, is this organism growing in the patient or was this already on the media before you inoculated? The different types of media, you have agar. Agar is a solid media. It is broth media that contains a solidifying agent. It, that solidifying agent is composed of marine algae materials and it is non-degradable by most, most bacteria. So you can put bacteria onto the agar and the agar is not going to degrade it or liquefy it. There are some organisms that can and you would have to use different media in those cases. But in general, agar is a really great media in, in clinical microbiology because you get isolation and you can do your macroscopic morphology on it. The different types of media are supportive, selective, differential, enrichment media, or enriched media. Supportive media is just your general type of media that's going to support the growth of all of your non-fastidious organisms. And by non-fastidious, that means non-fussy, organisms that don't have very, very specific growth requirements. So supportive media has general nutrients and it won't give one type of organism an advantage over another. So it's very general media. Examples of supportive media are nutrient broth or nutrient agar, tryptocase soy broth or tryptocase soy agar or TSA or TSB, and Luria Bertoni broth and agar or LB. Here's a tryptocase soy agar slant that's in a tube. And tryptocase soy can come in a broth or an agar, and it's a very common general supportive media used in both clinical and research laboratories. The next type of media is the selective media. Now, selective media contains one or more than one agent that's going to inhibit some organisms and not other organisms. So for example, selective media contains certain inhibitory agents such as dyes, like crystal violet is a dye that's commonly added to selective media because it will inhibit certain types of organisms. Salts are like bile salts could be added, alcohols, acids, antibiotics. So any media that contains an inhibitory agent in it is considered a selective media. And what you want to do is you want to grow a culture or I mean a patient sample that might contain a mixed group of organisms and you're trying to see if this patient has one specific organism, you want to streak that on selective media so you can find that one type of organism over all the other organisms that might be present. <laughs>
Examples of selective media are mannitol salt agar, hectoin enteric agar or HE agar, phenyl ethyl alcohol or PEA agar, or campy blood agar, which is a specific agar to grow the organism Campylobacter. This is a picture of a campy blood agar plate. It looks just like a regular sheep blood agar plate that's a common general supportive media used in the clinical laboratory. So it is very important if you wanted to go and streak an organism on blood agar that you had your general sheep blood agar plate or if you needed to look for Campylobacter you were using your campy blood agar plate because it's very easy to mix up the two. If you were using a campy blood agar plate to look for Campylobacter, you would need to grow it in specific atmospheric conditions. So, you, so Campylobacter is a microaerophile. If you remember, we talked about microaerophiles and their need to be in an environment that has low oxygen. You have to put the campy blood agar in a special microaerophilic bag that will generate this low oxygen condition. The next type of media is differential media. So differential media has factors in it that will allow you to distinguish one organism for another. And the common di di differentiating factors are pH indicators, such as neutral red. So the pH indicators in the differential media will allow the media to turn a different color when the pH either goes down or goes up. Examples of differential media are McConkie agar, and McConkie agar has a, um, an indicator in it that will allow you to differentiate lactose fermenting bacteria from non-lactose fermenting bacteria. Mannitol salt agar will allow you to see organisms that will ferment mannitol. Blood agar is a regular supportive media, but it is considered a differential media because it allows you to see organisms that, are, that will hemolyze red blood cells. And triple sugar iron agar is another example of differential media, and that allows you to see a lot of different things, such as um, fermentation and um, gas production and hydrogen sulfide production. We will talk about that media in a lot of detail later in the semester. So here's an example of the probably the most commonly used media in the clinical lab microbiology laboratory, and that is sheep blood agar. It is it is a regular tryptocase soy agar plate where five percent sheep blood has been added to it. So for blood agar, you are going to use it to differentiate organisms that can hemolyze red blood cells. We have organisms that don't do any hemolysis at all. We have those that will do beta hemolysis or completely hemolyze, which you'd be able to see a clear zone around it. You could see that on the bottom. Or you can see alpha hemolytic organisms, which are partial hemolysis. We'll talk about this in more detail when we talk to when we talk about streptococci in week two. McConkie agar is a very commonly used agar with the gram negative rods because it will allow you to differentiate the lactose fermenters from the non lactose fermenters. So McConkie agar has inhibitory agents, it's actually selective and differential. McConkie agar has inhibitory agents that will inhibit gram positive organisms and only allow gram negative organisms to grow on it. And then it's differential because it has a pH indicator in it as well as lactose and colonies will turn pink on McConkie agar if they ferment lactose. Non-lactose fermenters will, won't change the media to a pink color. It, the media is normally a, a light pink color, but the colonies themselves will become bright pink for, for lactose fermenters. Non-lactose fermenters won't change color at all. They'll stay a kind of a clear white, dull white color.
triple sugar iron agar is you could see in the picture on the right and tube one in the picture on the left all the way to the left is an uninoculated triple sugar iron agar slant so it's kind of a pinkish red in color when it's not inoculated Tube 2 in the picture on the left shows you two different things. It shows you glucose fermentation and sucrose or lactose fermentation, and it also shows you gas production. So in triple sugar iron agar, there are three different sugars. There's glucose, there's lactose, and there's sucrose. Organisms that can ferment glucose will turn the bottom or what's called the butt of the slant you can see that in the picture on the right it will change from that pink color to a yellow color so it has a pH indicator if the organism ferments glucose the butt becomes yellow but the slant portion doesn't change color the slant portion if the slant portion is yellow that means the organism is able to ferment glucose, I mean, sorry, lactose and or sucrose. So whether it ferments lactose or sucrose or both, the slant will become yellow. Organisms that produce hydrogen sulfide will turn triple sugar iron agar a black color because hydrogen sulfide um, forms a precipitate that is black. TSI agar um, media also will allow you to see gas production, and that will be bubbles or it'll make the media separate. So triple sugar iron agar is a really important manual type of media that used to be commonly used in the clinical laboratory. Clinical laboratories now don't use these tubed media because they're very labor intensive and they require a lot of incubator space. So the clinical microbiology laboratories now use instruments to um, come up to, to perform many, many different tests on an organism inside the instrument that will give a genus and species. So back in the old days, you would have had to inoculate all these different types of agar media and slants to come up with a reaction to figure out what organism you had. Now it's done in the instruments, but it's really important for you to understand what the tests that this instrument is, is performing and what the results mean and why the instrument is coming up with that genus and species. Hectoin enteric or HE agar is a very good differential and selective media for the enteric or intestinal organisms. So hectoin enteric agar is selective for the gram-negative intestinal organisms and it's selective because it will produce different colors depending on the organism. So on the left the is Enterobacter on HE agar and Enterobacter will turn the HE media orange because you get acid production due to carbohydrate fermentation. On the right, Salmonella doesn't produce the, car the acid because there isn't that carbohydrate fermentation. However, Salmonella produces hydrogen sulfide, so on HE media, the centers of the colonies will turn black. EMB, or eosin methylene blue, another differential and selective media, and this is another media like la uh, like McConkie agar that will show lactose fermentation. Bile esculin agar will <coughs> differentiate org organisms that produce bile esculin, which will turn the um, media black, or kind of a very, very dark brown to black color. Another type of media is an enrichment media. Enrichment media contains the required nutrients for a very specific 
organism. So you're only going to use enrichment media if you think an individual has a very specific organism that might be difficult to grow. So you want to coax this organism to grow better. Examples of enrichment media are buffered charcoal yeast extract agar or BCYE, Thayer Martin agar or selenite broth and we are going to talk about each of these in more detail later in the semester when we talk about the organisms that, you, that require these types of media. Enriched media contains factors to aid the growth of fastidious organisms. So enriched media, unlike enrichment agar that contains factor for, factors for one specific organism, enriched media will contain factors that won't just aid in the growth of one organism, it might aid in the growth of several organisms that are a little more fussy. So it's for um, fussy organisms, but also non-fussy organisms will grow on this media as well. Enriched media include things like blood agar or chocolate agar. So blood agar is regular tryptocase soy agar, which is just a supportive media that contains something yummy in it, such as the sheep blood. Chocolate agar is blood agar that's been hemolyzed and it turns it a brown color and again there are some organisms that will only grow in the presence of, of red blood cells and some that will only grow in the presence of hemolyzed red blood cells and again we're going to talk about these in more detail when we talk about the specific organisms that require red blood cells or hemolyzed red blood cells for growth. This is a picture of chocolate agar and it is called chocolate agar because that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like a nice melted chocolate bar sitting in a plate. We're now going to go into quality control. You'll see throughout my lectures I usually have some sort of a comic or funny statement in them just to um, provide some sort of humor in lectures that can sometimes get a little bit boring. So we're getting into quality control. Okay, quality control. Why bother with quality control? In a clinical laboratory, quality control is critical. You have to provide pr accurate results. If you don't have accur accurate results, you're not going to have accurate diagnoses and then you will not be able to treat properly. So accuracy is imperative. For quality control, there were regulations that were established in 1967 involving many different aspects of the microbiology laboratory. So these regulations revolved around personnel, equipment, media, and reagents. There are now operational guidelines that are mandated. So there, there are regular inspections in clinical laboratories that are going to make sure these guidelines are followed very strictly. And these were done to decrease error in a microbiology lab, to decrease that inaccuracy. The control procedures are um, total quality management or TQM and performance improvement procedures or PI. And these two um, types of control procedures are very common in quality control areas. The control procedures will be followed in ordering criteria for handling specimens, controlling the processing of a specimen, to control the environment and the equipment that's being used. All reagents and stains are controlled. The media, like I said before, the media has to be in expiration date. It has to have a certain color, certain type of moisture, pH, etc. Every part of a clinical laboratory is controlled.
So we want to control the specimen quality. So the ordering criteria of the tests needs to be controlled, how the specimens are collected, how they're transported from the collection site into the laboratory, and evaluation of the quality of the specimen that's delivered to the lab. All these are very critical in the beginning stages of a diagnostic laboratory. In the clinical lab, we always want to evaluate the samples. So if you find a, a, a specimen that comes in that's heavily contaminated, so, so we talked about before, you have agar plates and you want to open them up and make sure they're sterile. If there were a plate that you opened that was not sterile, you would want to discard it. And if that were a regular thing that that were happening, you'd want to call the company and report that you're getting contamination in the plates that are being delivered to you. Also, you always want to look at specimen samples. When you when you look at a specimen that comes in, does it seem to have a lot of organisms in it that have nothing to do with what the patient is thought to be infected with? So what you'd want to do is possibly do gram stains and you on a patient specimen, let's say a sputum specimen that comes in, you could gram stain that specimen and see if you have certain types of cells present that might indicate contamination with saliva or things that you don't really want in the sample. We always want to handle the specimens appropriately. So specimens that will degrade if they were left at room temperature need to be stored in a refrigerator if there's going to be a period of time between co collection and delivery into the laboratory. We always will have reports that we write up. Now they're all generated through the computer and um, if there were a specimen that was not suitably handled, let's say it was left at room temperature when it should have been refrigerated, you immediately need to call the healthcare provider and tell them that another sample is needed because that sample was not handled in a suitable manner. The environment of the laboratory is heavily controlled. The lab needs to be at a specific temperature. Median reagents that need to be stored at four degrees have to be stored in four degrees. They can't be at room temperature. The humidity must be maintained at a specific le uh, level. If wire loops are used nowadays, the calibrated disposable loops that you purchase are used, but some labs may still be using wire loops. Those should be calibrated. Reagents and stains all have to be inventoried. Anything out of date needs to be discarded. Um, man, uh, labels have to be clear, clearly marked with what is in the bottle, the date it came in, when it was open, the initials of the person that opened it. So all of these things are, are tightly controlled in a clinical um, laboratory. Whenever you're doing a test, usually you have to write down the lot of the reagent that is being used for that test. Culture media, we already talked about. You want to always look at it for sterility, moisture, is it the right color? Are, we always use control organisms on our culture media and are the control organisms growing in the time that they should? Do they look like what they should look like? Are they behaving normally? Antimicrobial susceptibility is a very important aspect in quality control. Uh, lots need to be te uh, tested with control strains. So if you're doing antimicrobial tests, you need to use very specific control strains that are purchased. Um, and any type of new test has to be tested first with those control stra uh, strains. 
there are daily controls that are usually used. Then there might be weekly controls that might be done if one component is altered. Um, each laboratory has a very specific set of daily, weekly, and possibly monthly monitoring and control testing that has to be done. If, some, if an unacceptable result comes up and you were doing weekly monitoring on it, you would have to then switch to daily monitoring until that issue was resolved. In addition to reagents and media and equipment, personnel is also evaluated in a clinical laboratory. So um, CAP will generate these um, unknowns and surveys that are sent to clinical laboratories and you will need to work these um, unknowns up just like you would a patient sample and then submit you don't know what's the right answer and you have to submit what what organism that you come up with and they will then test you and make sure you come up with the appropriate organism and make sure that each person in the laboratory is performing everything within the standards and also getting the appropriate answers. So you're tested for competency. Also, most of the credentialing or uh, Organ organizations now require a certain number of continuing education units per year and you have to prove that you've taken your continuing education at the end of the year you have the appropriate CEUs. So that is the end of our um, proliferation metabolism and quality control lecture. This is also the end of our general microbiology. Next week, we start our true clinical microbiology where we will discuss the gram-positive cocci.